Barbara Sue Frame was born on July 24, 1946. When Barbara was younger, her family described her as an eager little girl who wanted to learn and show her love and was always happy to help others. It was said that she had her mother's gentle heart and her father's ready smile. In 1985, 38-year-old Barbara was a mother of three children living in an apartment in Zanesville, Ohio. She was a devoted mother to her three children and also loved to cook and sew. In the early 80s, Barbara was devastated when her first marriage to Ernest Huber ended in divorce after 15 years. However, within a year, she was married again to a man named Jeff Frame. However, this marriage also wouldn't last, and after four and a half years, she was once again divorced. During the marriage, Jeff had allegedly been physically abusive toward Barbara and had even allegedly threatened her life on more than one occasion. The apartment she moved into was in the eyesight of Jeff's home, and he would come over every day and try to convince her to take him back. Her kids would later say that it felt like he was stalking their mother. Six weeks after the divorce, on January 30th, Barbara returned home from work at United Technologies. Not long after, Jeff arrived and said her divorce lawyer needed to see her right away to sign some papers. So Barbara made plans while she was out to stop and get groceries and visit her mother in the hospital who had cancer and told her kids she would be home afterward to cook dinner. The following day, her car was found parked behind Jocko's bar across the street from where she worked. It was the parking lot she typically used when she went to work, but her car was not in its usual spot. After her disappearance, Jeff stopped showing up at her apartment and began harassing her family members. Investigators had him take two polygraph exams and both were inconclusive. A person went to the police and said that Jeff had asked them for drugs that would disrupt the polygraph. Sadly, her mother passed away four days after Barbara disappeared. Unfortunately, it's now been over 38 years since Barbara went missing, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Daniel Patrick Villett, who went by Danny, was born in San Diego, California, to parents Daniel and Jane on February 23, 1981. By the age of 10, Danny had moved around quite a bit, living in California, Japan, and Washington, and finally ended up in Willard, Ohio in 1991. In 1998, 17-year-old Danny was a popular athletic Willard High School student who was described as witty and fun-loving. He was also considered an extremist who was very competitive and thought he was invulnerable to harm. Unfortunately, he struggled with manic depression and had allegedly fallen in with a bad crowd. On Saturday, October 24th, Danny got into an argument with his parents and stormed out of the house. Sadly, his parents would never see him alive again. He was last spotted near the local YMCA. Eleven days later, on November 4th, a farmer out working in his cornfield north of Willard found Danny's shirtless body. He had been strangled to death and was found with tracks across his chest. Due to drag marks through the field, investigators theorized that he was murdered elsewhere on the day he went missing before being dumped in the cornfield. When the toxicology report came back, it showed he had a trace amount of LSD in his system. While this didn't cause his death, it does show that he was possibly hanging around some less than savory individuals when he was murdered. However, where he went and who he was with still remains a mystery, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Denise Renee Chance was born on June 22, 1966, and was described as a sweet, soft-spoken girl. After graduating from high school, she got a job working in the kitchen at the Independent Order of Odd Fellows Nursing Home in Springfield, Ohio. She also rented a room in late December of 1984. About a week later, on Sunday, January 6, Denise spent the evening playing pool with her brother and friends at the Forest Lake Fishing and Camping Game Room. Afterward, she dropped her brother off at their mother's home and spoke to her briefly. This would be the last time her mother would ever see her alive. When she finally returned home, she called her boyfriend and spoke with him for a little bit. After hanging up, she stayed up until about 1.35 a.m. talking with her roommate, Vicki Deards, before answering another phone call and then heading off to bed. 
At 5.30 a.m., her roommate woke up freezing and quickly realized the door to the garage was open. She also discovered that Denise was gone and a steak knife was found on her bedroom floor. However, her shoes, coat, purse, and car keys, along with her car, were still there. So her roommate quickly reported her missing. Overnight, heavy snow had covered the ground outside, but there were no tracks in the snow, meaning she most likely left before it started. The snow started around 2.30 a.m., which means she left the home between 1.35 a.m. and 3 a.m. Ten weeks later, on March 20, 1985, when the snow began to melt away, a man looking for aluminum cans found her nude body in a drainage ditch along Baldwin Lane, over six miles away from her home. She had sadly been strangled to death. Former boyfriends of Denise were interviewed, but none led to a suspect. Since all of her belongings were left behind, investigators believe she was possibly abducted. Her mother believes that someone showed up at the home and Denise went out in her socks to talk to them but never came back. As of 2023, her killer has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Priscilla Dawn Hickman, who went by Dondi, was born in Waverly, Ohio on August 5, 1962. Dondi was described as a fun, outgoing, and a very generous individual. She married Anthony Hickman, but he started a three-year prison sentence in 2007 for vehicular assault. In late 2008, 46-year-old Dondi was living in Heath, Ohio, in the Ramp Creek Manufactured Home Community, and worked at a metal stamping plant in Hebron for about three months before being laid off. After that, Dondi, who had a love for animals, began a dog grooming business at her home in December. On January 15, 2009, Dondi's neighbors contacted the police and said they had not seen her in several days. The police then contacted her family and informed them about her disappearance. On January 18, her sisters, Michelle and Rosie, went by her home to feed her dog and also to see if they could find any information as to where their sister could be. Sadly, they would quickly get the answer after entering the home. Dondi's body was found inside her bedroom closet wrapped in a blanket. She had been strangled to death and had been dead between three to five days before being found. On January 13th, five days before her body was found, neighbors reported seeing a very tall, skinny, white man driving a 1980s Ford Ranger pickup truck enter her home. They had also seen this same man at her home four or five times prior to her murder. Unfortunately, this man has never been identified. DNA was recovered from the home, but has never matched anyone in the various DNA databases they uploaded it to. Her sisters have since had a billboard hung in Heath, Ohio, hoping someone will see it and come forward with information. However, as of 2023, her case remains unsolved. Tyler James Davis was born on June 30, 1989. In 2018, 29-year-old Tyler, his wife Brittany, and their two-year-old son Aaron lived in Wilmington, Ohio. Tyler and Brittany had met in 2013, but they didn't start dating until 2016. The following year, Brittany gave birth to their son, and they married later that year. Tyler, who was a local business manager and described as a very responsible person, was said to be an amazing father to his son. In February 2019, Tyler and Brittany traveled to Columbus, Ohio to celebrate her birthday and on the way dropped their son off at Tyler's parents' home. They checked into the Hilton Hotel at Easton Town Center and had a couple's massage scheduled for the next day. That evening, they met with a local friend, Sean Hughes, and spent the evening with him bar hopping in the Easton area. After they were done for the night, the three of them took an Uber back to the Hilton Hotel around 3 a.m., and Tyler fell asleep during the drive. However, when they pulled up to the hotel, he woke up in a confused state and began claiming they were not where they were supposed to be. Instead of going to his room, he told Brittany that he wanted to go for a walk around the block. So she went to her room because she needed to charge her phone and Sean followed Tyler. She returned outside about 30 minutes later but couldn't find either one of them. She began calling Tyler's phone but he wasn't answering. 
At 3.37, he called her back and said he was still walking but would be back soon. Sadly, he never did. A few minutes later, Sean showed back up alone and said that Tyler was still clearing his head. Brittany then repeatedly tried to call Tyler, but once again, he wasn't answering. Finally, at 4.10 a.m., he called her back and said he was going through the woods, could still see the hotel, and would be there in about five minutes. However, he still sounded confused. After hanging up, he immediately called back, but all she could hear on the phone was silence. Four seconds later, the call disconnected. She tried to call him back, but it went straight to his voicemail. At 4.30, Sean decided to go home and left. Tyler never arrived back at the hotel and was never seen again. Brittany, thinking he might have passed out or been arrested, waited anxiously by her phone, hoping to hear from him, but she never did. She finally called his parents and informed them of the situation. After that, she called 911 and reported him missing. However, police initially assumed he and Brittany had an argument and that he had simply run off, so they waited a few days before investigating. Once the investigation began, they checked surveillance footage at the hotel and saw Tyler walking diagonally away from it through the Easton Commons condominiums. The Google tracker on his phone indicates he was walking around the Huntington Bank complex on Stelzer Road and asked his phone for directions back to the hotel. He then ended up in the Abbott Foods parking lot where he either shut his phone off or the battery died. In order to confirm Brittany's account of the night, they had her take a polygraph exam and she passed. Authorities now believe that Tyler met with foul play and did not go missing intentionally, especially since they were able to obtain audio from his phone that showed he was using the voice activation feature for directions back to the hotel. Since he disappeared, there has been no activity on any of his bank cards or credit cards. The area has also been searched, but he was never found. In October 2021, Brittany asked the court to declare him legally dead, and on December 15th, her petition was granted. Sadly, as of 2023, Tyler has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. On October 23, 1975, Two hunters found a woman's naked body floating in the water at a tributary in Muddy Creek, four miles southeast of Oak Harbor, Ohio. She was never given an alias, but I feel like they should have listed her as Muddy Creek Jane Doe. She was estimated to be between 20 and 30 years old with medium length brown or reddish hair and brown or hazel eyes. She stood about five foot four and weighed about 140 pounds. It was determined that she was a smoker and had given birth to at least one child, possibly in the year before she died. She wore a ring described as a wire love knot pictured here. Her estimated date of death is October 20th, 1975, and she was buried on March 25th, 1976. As of 2023, her identity remains unknown. <laughs> 